we went to a doctor, many of the doctors in the field are Jewish. We went to uh, one particular person and, um, you know, we have a conversation and um, we're talking and we're talking and he never mentions statistics. And it's like we're waiting because that's what everybody does. Mm -hmm. So finally, we say to him, so what are the chances? And he says, what do you mean? I said, Doc, you know, you know, you know how old my wife is and how old I am and every single doctor posts statistics. What are the statistics? And he said, 100%. We said, what do you mean? He said, if God wants you to have a baby, you have a 100% chance of having a baby. If God doesn't want you to have a baby, you have a 0% chance of having a baby. Welcome back to another episode of Inspiration for the Nation. I'm Yaakov Langer, and this week I spoke to one of the most passionate people I've ever met. He's the CEO of OHEL. OHEL is one of the most important, powerful, what they do, it's so powerful, work in cholesterol. You'll hear all about them, literally too much to talk about, but like everything to do with mental health and helping people get by on a real, real scale, life and death scale. It's, it's tremendous what they do. But the person we talked to, how who he is and how he shaped to be who he is, is is incredible. And obviously one of the most moving parts of this episode is him talking about uh, him and his wife waiting 24 years for their daughter. It's, you know, kudos to him because I, I could tell that it's not easy for him to talk about this, but he feels it's important and he shared it. And um, what a passionate person. And I love how that seeps into everything he does when it comes to OL. You'll hear all about it. This episode is in memory of Shem David Ben Yaakov Shleima, in memory of Miriam Sarabas Yaakov Moshe, and in memory of Simcha Barrel David Ben Avram Moshe. This episode, you'll hear about two podcasts. You'll hear about Joma and their phone line. You're going to hear about the incredible unrestricted podcast, how it's how it's climbing charts, baby. And as well, you'll hear about the revolutionary Simcha time that guaranteed will change your life. Here is my conversation with David. I'm Yaakov Langer, and you're listening to Inspiration for the Nation. Thank you so much for, for being here. So there's there's a lot that I want to talk to you about. Um, and, and I want to get to OL and talk about all the incredible things OL does and is doing, but I first want to talk to you about, you know, where you grew up. You grew up in a, a Moshav in Eretz Yisrael. I grew up in uh, Tveria. I was born and uh, raised in Tveria, right by Rameir Balanes's Keva, literally a uh, hundred yards away uh, behind Rameir Balanes. It was a small shikun, uh, 15 families, and every day I went to a Bnei Yekiva Yeshiva and every day my brother and I would be home at one o'clock and by 1.15 at the latest, we were swimming in the Kinneret. Hmm. It was from here to the corner. Wow. From here to the shul over there. Also, if you ever like lost anything, you have Rav Meir Balanes right there. Rav Meir Balanes, it. you know, at that point, at, at, you know, what was it? Uh, one... Uh, one a Simon, one lira, whatever it was, you know, five cents. Right, so you always find it. But uh, you didn't really lose anything because the whole shikun was uh, the size of, uh, I don't know, one block of Hewlett. <laughs> what you can see out of your nice picturesque window. And then we just went down to the Kinneret every day from like one fifteen to 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. Wow, incredible. And, and you're parents were both Holocaust survivors? My parents, uh, my mother, Aleya Shalom, was an Auschwitz survivor amongst other camps. And uh, my father, Aleya Shalom, was in Siberia labor camp. And they were both survivors. Um, you know, survivors is a term that is used in so many different ways as a child of survivors. And the work that we do at OHEL with survivors of abuse, survivors of violence, survivors of so many different things. Um, we need to come up with another word because survivors is a great word. Uh, we encourage people, you were a victim, but you're not a victim today. Mm. You're a survivor today. And there are, you know, cancer survivors and car crash survivors and domestic violence survivors 
and abuse survivors and rape survivors and survivors of so many things. And, you know, on the one hand, it makes me think that it's a nice group, a general group. On the other hand, I feel that each one should have their own special word. Mm. So we, we, we need to somehow address that, but. I don't know if Merriam Webster is still alive. Another but. conversation. <laughs> no, it's Siri, it's Google, it's uh, mm -hmm. Chat uh, oh, GPT. <laughs> exactly, yeah, we can ask them for other words. <laughs> Who's Merriam Webster? <laughs> That's a good point. So I, I want to, there's so much about OOL. That word would normally come from me, not from you. <laughs> <laughs> so, and ChatGPT, I, I would faster think I would say it. Yeah. You, you pulled it out. Um, I want to talk to you something about, you know, and I know it's a little personal, so you could share as much or as little as you want. The fact that you and your wife were married for, I don't even know how many years, a lot of years. How, how many years were you married for before you had your child? Uh, 24 years, eight months, and five days. But as I say, who's counting? Oh, wow. Okay. So what, what, I'm so curious, what was that process like? Did you ever think that you would have a child? Um, so for many years um, after our Bas Yechida was born, Baruch Hashem, um, Eliana, Eliana Sivia, I waited till I had permission from my wife, Susan, um, before I could speak about this pop topic publicly, because you really need your, your wife's permission, your spouse's permission to speak about this, and my daughter's permission also. So they both know that we're having this conversation, and I asked them both about it. And I've spoken about this publicly. I'm very connected with A-Time, and I've spoken um, at their conferences with other people. And by the way, I use the word fertility issues I try to avoid the using the word infertility because mm. infertility is a negative term. Fertility is a positive term. And you always try to think about it positively. What was it like? It was um, on a scale of one to 10, it was uh, a billion. <laughs> it was difficult, it was hard, it was impossible, it was awful, it was terrible, it was uh, mind boggling, it was uh, lonely. Um, I I, uh, I don't know what other synonyms to use. Um, and um, let me let me go to the um, let me go to the end of the story. Um, my wife Susan, she always had betochen. In the darkest days, um, she just felt, and you know. <clears throat> People throw around the word challenging. Oh, that's a challenging word to spell. There are challenges in life that are uh, that are challenging. <clears throat> people are unfortunately very ill, people that are recovering, people that <clears throat> don't have panasa for a long time. <coughs> Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem, we have, um, we have a daughter. We have a wonderful son-in-law, David. Yeah. David Schwartz, David and Eliana Schwartz, and we have two amazing granddaughters, Tzipora and Toby. Baruch Hashem. Did you ever give up at a certain point? Like, I mean, <coughs> you hear people not having children for two years, five years, ten years, but like year fifteen, were you were you just like, okay, this is not the path that Hashem wants for us? It's a conversation that you have constantly, and if you don't have the conversation, you're constantly thinking about it, whether or not you have it with, um, whether or not you have it with your wife, or whether or not you have it with a doctor, or whether or not you have it with your best friend, or whether or not you have it with your love, or whether or not you have it alone. <clears throat> there were a couple of um, important moments. Um, one of our cousins, Maishi Friedman, Oliver Shalom. You know, you go to every rav. You got every Mikobel. You got every Rosh Hashiva. I'm a, I'm a Tovadaz boy. So I saw Rav Palm Zatzal at, um, at a Tovadaz dinner and I went to Rosh Hashiva. And I asked Rabbi, you know, my wife and I married many years. You know, could, could, could uh, Rosh Hashiva please give us a bracha? He said, I'm not a Rebbe. I don't give brachas. I said, Rosh Hashiva, um, 
you're my Rebbe, you're our Rosh Yeshiva, can I please have a bacham? He said, I, I can give you a birchas coin. Rav Palm said, Sal was a coin. I can give you a birchas coin. I said, Rav Palm, I'll take a bircha, bircha from the coin, Gadol. So you always think about it. You always think about it wherever you are, whatever you do. My cousin Maishi and I went out to swell one time and he wanted to go with me to a Mekobal. Trust me, we went to the Mekobal and we went to the Rabban and we went to the Shishivas. And I want to say that only in a positive way because I'm a believer. And I said, okay, what do I ask? What do I ask now? This was like how many times? And he said, what do you mean ask? You tell them what you want. Hmm. I said, what do you mean? I'm, I'm going to a gadol. I'm going to this. I'm telling him, yeah, you don't tell. He said, no, 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 you don't ask. You've already asked. It's time for you to tell him the bracha that you need. I must tell you that was one of the seminal moments where he said to me, and he's a very, he's a Tavadaz boy. Rav Parmes itself was his Rebbe. He gave a daf shir every single day. And he said to me, there are times in life that you have to demand, even to a gadol. And that was a moment. That was a moment. <clears throat> Another moment was, you know, doctors always talk about data, statistics. How old are you? How many years? Well, how old are you? Well, your chances are, you know, let me look at the chart. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're 30 years old, it's this statistics. If you're 35 years old, it's this statistic. If you're 42 years old, well, my gosh, you're at the bottom of the chart. And every doctor quoted, this is one of my favorite stories. I, I, I say this to, uh, when I speak to couples. We went to a doctor, many of the doctors in the field are Jewish. We went to uh, one particular person and, um, you know, we have a conversation and um, we're talking and we're talking and he never mentions statistics. And it's like we're waiting because that's what everybody does. Mm -hmm. So finally, we say to him, so what are the chances? And he says, what do you mean? I said, Doc, you know, you know, you know how old my wife is and how old I am and every single doctor posts the statistics. What are the statistics? And he said, 100%. We said, what do you mean? He said, if God wants you to have a baby, you have a 100% chance of having a baby. If God doesn't want you to have a baby, you have a 0% chance of having a baby. That was amazing. Wow. Wow. What, what, what was that moment when you realized that you guys were pregnant? What was that moment like? I love how you say when you guys feel like... <laughs> 2022, 2023, very progressive. When you found out your wife was pregnant. You know, it is uncanny. It is uncanny that we're doing, that you're asking me that question and that we are having the conversation here a couple of days before Purim. Because we learned about it a couple of days before Purim. It is absolutely unbelievable that you asked me that question and here we're sitting a couple of days before Purim. Wow. So Hashem sent us the news a couple of days before Purim, just like we're sitting here. I remember where I was standing. You know, people remember, depending on how old they are, where they were at certain events. Susan and I know exactly where we were. We were, you know, different places. I remember where I was standing. I remember what time of the day it was. And I remember there being total silence on the phone. That's all. I, I don't think anything else needs to be said. Was there that like heaven on earth feeling that you had when your daughter was born? Like, I, I, I mean, I've waited for things in my life, but I can't imagine waiting for over 24 years for... People have waited in this past year, six months for the car to be delivered. And they were like so upset. When can I get my car? What is going on? When can I go back to Eretz World to visit it after COVID? There are no words to explain it, Yaakov. There's no words to explain it. It's like, 
Our daughter's name is Eliana. Eliana. Hashem answered. Hmm. Eliana. Eliana Tzivya. Tzivya after my mother's mother. So her name is Eliana Tzivya. And uh, so when I got home and I told my mother, you know, the baby's name is Eliana Tzivya. She said, couldn't you name it Tzivya Eliana? <laughs> <laughs> I said, Ima. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's like you want to tell your mother, give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, Hashem. I have, we have no words. Um, we have no words. It's, um, let me tell you what my Vav and Shabbos said. Let me tell you what my Vav and Shabbos said. Rabbi Mordechai Stern, I David and Hechel David, or people know it as a W. He was speaking about the Pasha Tuma and that Hashem gave Moshe Rabbeinu every single nuance of a measurement to build the Mishkan. There are many different explanations of what it means. Tovav explained. Moshe Rabbeinu, you know, build this and build the courtyard and build the outside and the inner and 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 the Kvashim and use this and, and the Parochis and use everything. And Rav Stern said, there was one thing that Moshe Rabbeinu couldn't build. He couldn't build a menorah. And, and, and he went back to Hashem and he said, I can't build it. My wife spoke for 20 minutes. I'm giving it to you in two minutes. I'm not going to do it justice. Moshe Rabbeinu went to Hashem and he said, you build it. I can't do it. I'm Hashem said, I gave you the instructions, the menorah, the center, the three side pieces, the kaftorim, everything, how to build a menorah. Follow, you're building everything else. Follow whatever conversation Moshe Rabbeinu has with Hashem. <laughs> and we know that this is, that it's his birthday and it's your site, Zaina, the next week. Moshe Rabbeinu tries and tries, and he can't build it. And he says to Hashem, you build the menorah. And so the question is asked, the Mephoshim, the, the Vav quoted exactly, you know, what it is he explained it so beautifully. And Moshe Rabbeinu couldn't build a menorah. And what's Pshat? Moshe Rabbeinu said to Hashem, I can't build a menorah, you build it. He said to Hashem, you take care of this. You take care of of the menorah. And Hashem, however he created the fire, he built the menorah. And I went to my Vav afterwards and I said, you know, I don't know what anybody else was thinking, but I was thinking about the whole issue of fertility. That at some point I said to my Vav, you just give yourself over to God. You can daven and you can go to doctors and you can go to Rabbanim. At some point, it's like Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu said to Hashem, I can't do it, Hashem. You build the menorah. That to me was like the conversation about fertility. At some point you say, God, I'm done. I'm giving myself to you. You want to give me a baby? I would like a baby. I'm giving myself to you. I can't do this anymore. It's in your hands. It was like such a moment. Moshe Rabbeinu said to Hashem, I can't. Mm -hmm. It's really beautiful. So I, I want to I wanna change gears a little and maybe we'll get Please, back. Please, thank we'll you. <laughs> Sorry. I, I also, I know that just uh, based on my research of you that you're you're a more introverted fellow. Um, so talking about these personal stuff. You wouldn't think from this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I really appreciate you opening up about it. Um, but I want to I wanna switch gears to the oh hell. Um, what, where were you before that OHEL made sense? Because OHEL is around since 1969. OHEL is uh, around since 1969, 54 years. Wow. Right. So what, when did you step into the OHEL picture? On August 1, 1995, and my life changed again. My life changed, uh, you know, in that year, in that year, Susan and I moved into a new home. We came to the five towns from Canarsi, as many of our friends did, and... I started my job at Ohel, and Eliana was born in one year. It's a big year. Talk about Mishana Mak and Mishana Mazel, right. really. And I, I had done some training for Ohel a number of years earlier. I've done a lot of training. I had done some publications. And so Ohel, through Ruth Vagarskiel, as Shalom was a board member, Ruth and I uh, went back um, many years earlier she brought me into OHEL to do some training, so OHEL and I knew a little bit about each other. I was work, always working in the field of disabilities. This was my career. 
I have a, a master's in psychology and I have a, an MBA, both from NYU. And so I, my life was devoted to public service and to people with disabilities. Is and there a reason like from your past that that's why or kind of that's just what happened? It's not from my Israeli past. It's not from my ball playing past. Um, it's, I, it, I just went that route. You're passionate about it. Okay. Um, it might have been, you know, counterculture because, of course, my mother wanted me to be an attorney. Mm. And so I graduated with a degree in political science and I said, okay, now what? <laughs> Let me be practical and go for a master's from NYU in psychology. And so I did that. So, and then I went back to NYU for my MBA, which was really a, one of the, one of the good moves, one of the good moves in life. And so Ohel um, reached out to me, invited me in for conversation. And in the interviews, I was working in the non-Jewish world. I was doing some work in, in Queens. I was helping small startup, not-for-profits, um, get off the ground, helping them establish boards, helping them with um, their banking relationships. I was doing some work in Harlem and in Spanish Harlem, developing housing for people with disabilities. So in essence, OHEL asked me to do what I love doing in the Jewish community. It was a no-brainer for you. It was um, a no-brainer. It was, um, you know, we got uh, we got married quickly, <laughs> and I started in August one, nineteen ninety five, and I I like to say that um, that I like to say that I've never had a bad day at Ohio. I've had difficult days. I've had hard days. You know, people people sometimes don't get out of bed. People sometimes feel that their life is bad. People sometimes feel that they're having such a bad day that they want to do terrible things to themselves. I've never had a bad day at Ohio. I've never had a day that I didn't want to go into work. But I've had a lot of difficult days. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't have hard days in life? So what what were the biggest challenges that you saw in the community <clears throat> that you wanted to address when you got to OL? Stigma. Stigma. We're talking 25 years ago. You know, the world has gone from one opposite to another opposite. Yeah. Stigma. Stigma was that um, people don't understand that they were literally closet children. People can't I, What does that phrase them. mean, was a closet child? People had children with mental illness or people with disabilities that didn't leave the house. The shame, the stigma. Um, I remember going to a, I remember going to a bris years ago, shortly after I joined OHO, in a community in Brooklyn. I went over to a person that I knew. His son was living at OHO. Shortly after I got there, his son was living in one of our residences. His son with mental illness, and um, takes me aside. After he shakes my hand, he walks with me and he says, please don't tell anyone that you know me or that my son lives at Ohio. No one knows that I have a son who lives at Ohio. That was not unusual. That was not unusual. It's painful, shame, stigma. OHEL is a mental health service organization and OHEL is a teaching institution. And so we set about very hard to help the community to destigmatize disabilities, to destigmatize people with mental illness by talking about it, by having the best speakers speak about it. We had people who lost their children to drug, accidental drug overdose. <clears throat> we had parents who lost their children to various types of suicide. Speak publicly about it. Today you open up, you open up, or you read on the website and people are speaking. It's so, it's so different. Hmm. It may have gotten way too far on the pendulum that right now 
people are much too quick. You know, you need therapy. I don't like the way you sound. Mm. You need therapy or you need this or you need that. It's gone way to the other extreme. Interesting. Everything has to have a balance. Interesting. That's that's crazy. I, yeah, I would, um, I'm a little shocked, honestly. I guess I'm just mufka from it. But that fact that you'll have people that were so embarrassed by their child just not doing well in whatever capacity and then that they're so ashamed that no one could know about it. You can't blame any parent. And I don't use the word embarrassed. It's painful. There were much fewer services years ago than there are today. Today, there's a plethora of services, so many things, and you can learn so much more today. It's, um, you know, it's, um, it's a very difficult, lonely, even dark place to be in. And today, housing, day programs, outpatient counseling, medication is very different than it was not only 50 years ago, but even 25 years ago. And today people understand that the, that, that it, we just live in a different world. Look at this room. We just live in a different world. Right, Look right. at this conversation. What's a podcast a couple of years ago? Right. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Something that, that I imagine comes up a lot with OL, because it just comes up everywhere. So especially OL is anxiety how many people are going through anxiety and just struggling with that pre-covid we have we keep pretty good data speaking of data from before we keep pretty good data pre-covid one out of every three calls that we received related to anxiety the family of anxiety in some way anxiety anxiety in children adolescents adults anxiety can be caused uh, because of uh, marital conflict, high conflict divorce, the loss of a job, uh, bullying, a child not doing well, um, a child being behind. Anxiety is caused in many different ways. So prior to COVID, one out of every three calls we received related to anxiety. Today, two out of every three calls we get relates to anxiety. Hmm. Think about the elderly being alone. Think about the number of people that passed away. Think about the people who did not have an opportunity to be with their parent or someone when they died. They weren't at the burial. They haven't forgotten about that. Children who spent literally a year at home, even though the yeshivas were open, some were not. Distant learning and learning, you know, remotely. Two out of three calls we get relate to anxiety. We'll be right back to this week's episode. If you've been listening to this episode lately, you've been hearing me talk about one of my favorite podcasts. Yes, the Unrestricted Podcast. It's simple. You are watching or listening to podcasts, hopefully because you like it, maybe because you hate it. Maybe you're listening to this because like, I hate Yaakov and I hate everything he does. Let me listen so it'll fuel my anger. But if you're not in that category, you're hopefully liking this. You're hopefully liking the inspirational, awesome, incredible people that we're bringing on. So that's what the Unrestricted Podcast is doing, but in a different way. Steve Savitsky runs a great show. He's a former CEO of the OU, incredible. And he is, the, the handcuffs are off. I mean, I don't know if he actually ever had like, that, that's a bad, that doesn't make sense. He never had handcuffs. But I mean in the way that he could really say, speak his mind. He has so much experience and he sits down with people that have so much experience doing really high level, Knesset level, chief rabbi level kind of stuff and that they helped lead the Jewish people and they could sit down and have a real honest conversation. We had episodes so far with, I'm going to start backwards because it's so incredible that he had him. I'm jealous. Rabbi Pinchas Goldschmidt, exile chief rabbi of Moscow and talking about how he got to his position and how things changed very quickly overnight. And um, wow, incredible. He had Michal Cutler, who is a former blue and white and, and her role in the Knesset. He had Richard Joel and Amos Yadlin. It's it's people that, I meant former president of, of Yeshiva University. It's people that are are that were on the top and still on the top, but they're not in that position anymore. And you get a really good insight. And I think that when people have podcasts, 
so often the hosts talk too much. I always try as my as much as possible, talk as little as possible so you can hear the guests. I think Steve does a great job at really navigating the conversation. So if you haven't yet, yes, you, I'm talking to you. I know that other, your friend checked it out. You didn't check it out yet. And I've been talking about this for so long. I'm personally a little offended. Go check out the Unrestricted Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Times of Israel. They're on timesofisrael.com. Wow, I'm jealous. Times of Israel, reach out to me. I'd love to be on you. Okay, now back to this week's episode. My next question is probably probably more geared towards you know the doctors and psychologists at OHEL, but you having the macro uh, look at all of it around is anxiety getting just more out of hand, or is it we're just in this time frame that you mentioned that people are just more expressive and open with their challenges, or both? Both, both. It's the fact that people feel that they can get help. Um, you know, why cope with something on your own? You and you've got a good pediatrician who's now very conversant in it, um, but maybe in school. Um, secondly, it's also sign of the times. People are starting to use terminology that I don't personally particularly care for. But who am I? You know, a COVID baby. I, I you know, it's a, uh, you know, this Gen X and Gen Y and Gen Z and and uh, I hope this is not Gen COVID. I I really hope. I once wrote an article about this. Who are the gods of naming decades? <laughs> Where does that come from? <laughs> who makes that decision? It's the same people who makes the street name decisions. I, I don't know who who wrote. I all the would street like name. that opportunity to make to name one decade. Right. You know, David's decade, <laughs> Yaakov's decade. You know, yeah, that something good. like that. So it's 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 also a period of time that we're going through. COVID is still not in the rearview mirror. We'd like it to be. But it still it, it still has some residual effect on us, and the the ability to talk about anxiety, the ability also not necessarily to rush into medication. Um, you know, medication is important, and medication helps, but not necessarily to rush into it. Hopefully, we'll get everything goes back to a balance mm. at some point. There is also the challenge of suicide that I imagine OL is, is seeing if there's anyone who's seeing it it's it's OL um, suicide is the um, second reason second leading cause of death among adolescents and young adults that's astounding that people don't understand that the first leading cause of death amongst young people adolescents and young adults is accidents suicide is the second leading cause of death in this country OHEL has been a leader in developing and providing many services. Um, suicide response is part of our um, trauma work. Our um, Zacta Family National Trauma Center, and seven months ago, we opened up <clears throat> in South Florida, the Brescia Family South Florida Trauma Services, and a month ago, we opened up the Kestenbaum Family International Children's Services. You know, we have responded to suicides as young as 10 years old. And as I'm speaking with you, I um, can think specifically where that was and who that was. A 10-year-old boy, another 10-year-old boy, a 12-year-old girl, a 15-year-old boy, and I can continue with that. And I remember who they are, and I remember where they live, and I remember the circumstances. <clears throat> and it's it's something that people should take serious. If someone's child is saying, I want to kill myself, I'm angry, or they're taking... You know, it's it's like we're not talking about taking a pen and, you know, like we're not talking about playful things. If a parent thinks that their child, and every parent knows their child, that's something that needs to be taken really seriously. It, one of the downsides of cloud well, we got to change this dark conversation to something really happy <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know, I think it's very it's very um important to talk about this as difficult as it is um i lost my train of thought but i was i was thinking of say oh yeah how do you 
again, it's a personal question, but how do you personally cope with that? Meaning when you're doing cloud work and you're helping so many people in need um, to, you know, like you just mentioned a few, you know, children that committed suicide. Like how, how do you go on? Isn't that like heartbreaking to deal with that? The answer is yes, it's heartbreaking. First of all, if I may just um, change one of your words. I, by the way, as I'm saying people in need, I'm like, you're for sure not going <laughs> to like no, that phrase. No, 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 no. I was one. actually going to say, we use the word suicide. People suicide, they don't commit suicide. Mm -hmm. They suicide. Mm -hmm. And people who actively think about suicide will eventually succeed. And that's why, and that's why intervention, that's why help is very important. People who actively think about suicide or people who actively attempt suicide will eventually succeed. How do you do it? Because it's my life. Because I, it makes a difference. Yeah, I get it. But because still, I help one person. But how? But how do you not get crushed from it? It's 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 crushing to like. It's not like you're a dentist and like, oh, it was a hard root canal that day. The patient was mean to me. Like, it's dealing with life and death and on a very big scale. You know, when I give a talk, and let's say that this is a talk, let's say that we've got 300 people sitting in the audience and we're talking to 300 people. You've got thousands it, and tens of thousands of listeners. It's in a way listener. like that, just it not is. live. But it is, yeah. it is. This is a talk, you've got tens of thousands of listeners. So I either begin or end my talk with the following comment, irrespective of what it is the subject that I'm talking about. I'm only speaking to one person here in the audience. I'm not really sure if it's you or you or you or you, hmm. but I know I'm speaking to one person in this audience. And at the end of this evening, one of you is going away thinking he was talking to me. I have no idea who that is, but I know it's going to make a difference to that one person. It makes a difference to one person. You don't, you know, listen, you come to work, you leave work, you hope you make a difference. You hope after 120, however many days you have over here, that one person will say a nice thing about you. You know, Tov Shem Tov Mishem and Tov. That's what keeps you going. That the majority of people who you help don't call you back to say thanks. You know, David, Mr. Mandel, or can can you help me with this? Or sure, let me connect you with my colleague. Please talk to my colleague. They're smarter than I am. They're better than I am. They know what they're doing. I try to connect people as much as possible. You know, it's never about me. Majority of people don't call you back to say thank you. But a few do. And in my office, on my wall, like you have over there on the shelf, I've got a bunch of thank you letters. You know, like like the, like the OB... GYNs have, they've got these thank you notes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Langer. My son was born six pounds, eight ounces, whatever. Mm -hmm. I've got a bunch of thank you notes. And every once in a while, I have a person that calls and says thank you or invites me to something, a simcha. I go. I don't introduce myself. I don't say I'm from Ohel. I just go. Those occasional thank you notes those occasional thank yous from a person, the 14 karat gold. That's really, really beautiful. So there's an overwhelming amount of programs and just initiatives that OL has. So we definitely can't go through all of them um, or even most of them. So anyone who wants to check it out could go on the website. But there's something that I personally find fascinating. It's Camp Kaylee. Yes. Could uh. you tell us about Camp Kaylee and like, the magic behind it. Ah, the magic behind it. Okay, so I'm assuming that this conversation is going another two hours. Because there's <laughs> oh, no gosh. way we're finishing in just I'm a couple of minutes. It, Cam Cayley. Cam Cayley, the word Cayley is um, Harvey and Gloria Cayley, a family. Uh, my Shalman and I went to um, Harvey and Gloria Cayley um, 13 years ago. So we have a vision for a camp, a fully integrated camp. Typical kids together with kids with disabilities. Not one cabin or one bunk in a camp with 300 kids or two bunks. Every single bunk cabin is going to have typical kids and two or three kids with disabilities. 20%, 25%, whatever the ratio is. And we, um, and we pitched it to him. And we had a concept and we had a camp. We had a piece of property. We really thought about it many times. Asher Fogel, 
Oliver Shalom, one of my colleagues, who unfortunately passed away a number of years ago, may have been the original, you know, thinker about this. And we went to Avi Kale, he was sitting in his office, many circuits, and we're speaking to him. And he says, how much is the camp? And he told him, you know, what the camp cost. He said, how much are you asking me for? And we took a deep breath and we said a number, <laughs> which wasn't the full number. And he said, you have a name for the camp? And uh, we said, no, not yet. He said, I'll tell you what. I'll give you more than what you're asking for. Which donor does this? I'll wow. give you more than what you're asking for. I'll tonight, I want you to name the camp, Camp Kaylee. And Moish Hellman, the president of old time, are looking at each other. And we say, Camp Kaylee, Kaylee, Kaylee K. Van Veyu. You want us to name the camp like Camp God? Camp Hashem? Mm -hmm. We got Hashem. The name of the camp is Camp Kaylee. <clears throat> Ellie Brazil is our camp director. And um, you know Ellie Brazil from the neighborhood over here. Sure. And he's a magical person. Camp Kaylee is a magical place. And Ellie Brazil and David Charviet and and the entire staff uh, of of the head counselors and the division heads and everybody, every part of the camp. The reason that it's a magical place is we have kids with Down syndrome. We have kids on the autism spectrum. Every single bunk has two or three kids with disabilities. The majority of them are kids on the spectrum. The magic of Cam Kaylee is that at the end of the summer, when your kid comes home, a typical kid, and you say to him, David, how many kids in your bunk had a disability? And he says zero, not even realizing that three of the kids were on the spectrum. That's the magic of Cam Kaylee. Hmm. Really beautiful. Because, I mean, there's a lot of beautiful camps and organizations out there, but the integration of, you know, everyone in the same bunk in an equal way is, is really beautiful. Did you get pushback from anyone in the beginning? To like, nah, that will never be able to happen. It's a nice idea, but come on. Every camp has one of those kinds of bunks that may be like that. If you allow yourself to be stopped by the naysayers, you don't accomplish anything in mm -hmm. life. You just, you just literally drive faster. Mm -hmm. And it gives you the incentive to work harder. Look, you know, before Cam Kaylee, what does OHL do? OHL started as a foster care agency. No one was doing that. We're still the only organization that does foster care in a Jewish home, guarantees a Jewish child a Jewish home. We do shelters for battered women. There are six organizations that have housing for people with developmental disabilities in the Jewish community. OHL is the only one that has housing for people with mental illness in the Jewish community in the country, literally in the country. We do addiction treatment. Um, we do, um, we do uh, the National Trauma Center. Um, we do cutting edge, Kim Kelly's cutting edge. The board of directors of OL since day one always viewed themselves as if, if the community needs something, we want to be in the lead in it. If no one else is doing it, we want to be there. That's how OHEL has expanded. When I joined OHEL, the board of directors' message to me was, David, we would like to expand OHEL, and we want to support the professional team to expand OHEL. OHEL is a, it's an organization of 1,400 employees, $84 million budget throughout New York City, and, and we are opening housing in New Jersey right now. My colleague Adam Lancer, our chief operating officer, is leading the way. We go where we go where we need it. We'll be right back to this week's episode. And I am telling you, one of the most heartfelt moments are coming up. So get ready for that. You may shed a tear, but before then, I need to tell you about the revolution going on. The revolution going on is that there's a war going. No, I'm not going to talk about war. I don't know politics. I don't know if you noticed. I don't talk much about politics. But what I want to talk about is something that I love and believe in. It's about doing chesed, about helping other people. Can you believe it? Someone said, hey, my brother, Simcha Belsky, Oliver Shalom, 
was someone who represented Chesed and the world needs to know about him and what he did. And he just would go out of his way to help people. So this is what Simcha time is. This week, you're going to go out and do a Chesed that you weren't going to actually do. Now, I'm not talking about holding open the door that you're going to do anyways. You don't want to look like a jerk not to hold open the door for that bubby walking through. It's it's about like, oh, I have to be home. And someone's like, I really need a ride. And you're like, I really need to get home because I have to do a phone call with this person. And you're like, you know what? This person could take the phone call an hour later. I'm going to go ahead and give this person a ride home or or donate my time to go out and help a food bank or whatever it is, but it's going out of your way to do a chesed to really transform someone's life. But here's the life hack. It will transform your life and to really make it go home on Shabbos and you will talk about the chesed that you've done. So you go around the table, you say, hey, everyone, it's time for a simcha time. Boys and girls, tell me what you did this week. Start off with you say, okay, I'm going to brag. I'm going to brag about the chest that I did. I did X, Y, and Z, or just X, Y, or Z. And you go around the table and everyone shares what their simcha time was, what how they brought simcha to someone else, how they did chesed. I guarantee you, I promise you, there's a promise money back guarantee that you will have a transformed week, a transformed month, a transformed life by going out of your way. You could also submit your Simcha Times to SimchaTime.org. You can let them, the people helping sponsor this episode, this podcast, know that, hey, you're making a big impact by letting Inspiration for the Nation do what they do. But also, here's what I did for someone. And like, wow, it made me feel so good. Or maybe someone did a Simple Time for you. Go to SimpleTime.org and share what you've done. But most importantly, go ahead and do the Simple Time. Now, back to this week's episode. My connection to OL is um, not really so typical. I, I used to live on uh, Beach Beach Ninth, uh, uh, 156 Beach Ninth. Every single person. Oh, the OL building. I should just introduce it as the OL building because yeah. that's <laughs> literally what where I lived for I feel bad for Mr. Wolf, the owner developer. <laughs> Everybody calls it the OHO building. Honestly, if I was him, I'd be happy. It's something proud to be be a part of. Right. And, and it was it was yeah, it was it was nice to young be, couples live there in yeah. those apartments. Yeah, it was it was a great experience. What what could you you advise people in leadership roles? I, I mean you've been the leader of OL for quite a while now. Leadership is my favorite word. Hmm. <clears throat> I I so believe in in the concept of leadership they are the difference makers think about the the leaders the true leaders in every industry we always talk about leaders i use the definition from a fellow named russell akoff who wrote a who wrote a piece 40 years ago called transformational leadership what is the difference between a manager supervisor and a leader a manager or a supervisor tells people what they need to do. A leader shows people what can be done and they conclude on their own and go and do it. That is leadership. A leader doesn't tell. A leader shows by example, by definition, Leadership to me is, when I interview for senior positions at OHEL, I'm only interviewing for leadership. I assume by the time you come in your life, take the risk or lose the chance right behind you. Mm. I assume by the time you come for this position as a senior person that you know your content. I'm not interested what you know. I assume you've already learned it and you know it in your experience. I want to know how you think. I want to know how you're going to deal in a crisis. I learned from my mentor, one of my mentors, Fred McCormick, may rest in peace, the one question interview. We can talk for an hour, we can talk for a half hour, but I'm only going to ask you one question that will be the difference in determining whether or not to me personally, you are that person. And it has nothing to do with your knowledge. It's going to do with, I want to see how you think. One question interview. What's the question? First of all, the question is made up as I'm listening to you. So the question could be something like,
tell me a choice that you've made in your life that you could take back and do it different. What was that? And what would you do? Go ahead. Go you, for it. I should do this answer? <laughs> if you want to do it live. Yeah, let's do it, I guess. <laughs> a choice. That, and I'll, maybe I'll flip the question back to you, but you probably have an answer. Um, Another question. Not to put you on the spot. I, I'm okay. I think Go it's, it's challenging being put on the spot. It's good. There's a lot of things I want to say that I can't really say on air, so that has to go off. Um, People ask me, David, are you asking me personally or professionally? I say, go ahead. I think for me, it's very intertwined, those things. I, I, I would say when, I don't want to be too specific, but starting new ventures to make sure that if you're doing it with someone else, to make sure, at least, this happened to me and I've done a bunch of things, but I, I've started a bunch of stuff. There was one particular time I could think of that I had something in mind and the other person had something in mind. And I think it could have worked for longer, but we weren't as clear as we could have been. I, I know I'm being a little vague only because I probably, if it was like a real interview, I, I'd share more. But uh, I, I, I learned the hard way that being super clear and also even getting the other side to be very clear is, is so important to really build together because if you're each hiding things, it's it's going to come crashing down at some point. Now, it's amazing what people answer. You know, the people that answer very safe and, and say, oh, I wish I would have taken dance lessons. Or I wish I would have gone to a different college. That's about as safe as you can get. Right. And then people say, look, I married the wrong person or, or uh, I should have waited 10 years or I missed my chance or whatever it is. You want to you want to see if the person is taking a risk in the conversation, because mm -hmm. leadership entails risk. It almost doesn't make a difference what the answer is. Mm. It's whether or not you're being honest in that conversation, and you're taking a risk in that relationship that just started ten minutes ago. Right. That's a difference maker. Is that is that mean that like you're looking for people that could be honest and vulnerable? Is that what it is? Vulnerable is a great word. Not looking for them to be vulnerable. But OHEL is about taking risks. The work that we do involves a certain amount of risk. Developing the programs. We work in a high-risk community people with mental illness, people with addictions, people in violence, people who rely on us, people in high conflict divorce. We work in a, we work on 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 issues that involve risk. And so suicide. And so I want to know how you think, <clears throat> excuse me, because you're going to be leading a group of people. Mm. I want to take a, a CAT scan of your brain in the conversation. And this is the only way this is my belief system. Mm -hmm. I got my job with Fred McCormick, who turned out to be my mentor. Little did I know, he asked me one question. I didn't realize that that was a test. <laughs> and I took a risk. He said, "Go to." I was already working in that organization. He said, go to your office, clean it up, and come over here. You're my new assistant. You're working next door. Literally. I mean, this man was like on a on a brilliant beyond comprehension. And I happened to answer what he felt made a difference. I learned from him. That was many years ago. The one question interview. That's really clever and very smart and reveals a lot. We'll be right back to this week's episode. I know I said that before, but now I mean it. I need to tell you about something that's maybe one of the most important things on your bucket list of things that you need to do. It's your health. It's so easy for us to be so invested and in thinking about our cars, our families, our houses, our Torah, everything, the things that are really, really important. But we can't do any of that if we don't have good health, if we don't take care of ourselves and we need to be as educated as possible. There's so much unfortunate misinformation going out there. I see it all the time. I see it from people responding to the show and I'm like, 
I feel bad. I, I, I hope you get more educated on knowing how to make your life healthier. That's I want you to live longer. I want you to live a healthy, long life so you can serve Hashem as well as possible. In walks Joma, an incredible organization, Jewish um, Orthodox Women's Medical Association that really, really cares about people um, and and they they really want you to live a healthier life. You could say from everything today till tomorrow, I've seen the work they've done, I've spoken to them, and there's sometimes unfortunate people that don't really get the big picture and understand what they're trying to do, but they really, really want you to live a healthier life and think about it. Think about it. You could call them, you could ask questions to them. They have a hotline. It's called, it's the number is 929 Gazunt. Gazunt is G-E-Z-U-N-T. They have incredible podcasts. You could just type in Joma, J-O-W-M-A, where they talk about really important topics that sometimes are uncomfortable. Sometimes you don't really have access, but in 2023, they're creating a phone line. They're creating a podcast where you could go ahead and really better your health. So I know it. I know there's some people out there that just doesn't care. I probably feel more in the, I fall more into that bucket of like, I'm too busy, but it's never, you're never too busy to care about your health and get educated and get entertained about it because they have actually good entertainment and just information that is so helpful. Then there's another bucket of people that are challengers. They don't really believe it. And I don't know, the system is broken. I don't, that's fine. And that's fear. You could have your questions. You could call them. You could hear the people there. They have their head on straight. Don't listen to some false misinformation going out there. We're in the time where there's so much misinformation. Talk to the people with their heads on straight. You could ask your Rabbanim. You could ask people that really know about Joma. They're incredible. Go ahead. You could go to their website, joma.org, listen to their podcast, or give their phone a call. Now, back to my conversation with the one, the only, the David. So as we wind down this interview, I like to ask my guests all questions that I, I think they're fun, but uh, sometimes it makes people cry. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> no tears over here. Um, out of the 613 mitzvahs, what is your favorite mitzvah? I don't know if this is a mitzvah or not. So if it's not, I'll make it a we're mitzvah. Pretty, we're pretty loose with what, what's the okay. mitzvah here. We're pretty so. loose with the mitzvahs. <laughs> no, no, no. Just, it's a hard question to really answer. So I don't know if this is a mitzvah or not, but um, every Friday night, benching my daughter, the bacha that um, Yaakov Avinu gave to Menashe and Ephraim, that I've given my daughter from as far as I can remember, the moment she was born, every Friday night, if we're together before Kiddush, and if we're not together, we speak to each other right before Shabbos. If it's not a mitzvah, oh my gosh, it should really be one of the, <laughs> one of the great mitzvahs. <laughs> I think maybe falls into Chanukh, so, so it's good. Uh, that's a very beautiful answer. Uh, if there was one person from history or someone who, who recently passed away that you could spend an hour with, who would it be and why? See, that's the one question interview. I guess so. I mean, I ask everyone that. Maybe I'm, I'm interviewing everyone to like be the CEO. That's of a, a one question interview because you want to see who the person has in mind and why. I mean, it's like, you know, Adam Avishan because he was able to see, walk the entire world. Yaakov because he was able to see when Mashiach comes before Hashem took the Nevo away when he gave his children the Bachas. Moshe Rabbeinu coming up. I'm, I'm um, going back full circle. I'm, I'm a Saba, a very, very proud Saba. An American Israeli Jew, an Israeli American Jew, very proud. So I would say Yoshua Ben Nun. Yoshua Ben Nun, you know, Yoshua Ben Nun didn't have any children. And um, when I think about Yoshua Ben Nun, it's like, you know, when somebody doesn't have children, they worry whether they'll be remembered, who will visit their grave, things like that. So Yeshua ben Nun, because he was the one that brought Bnei Yisrael into Eretz Yisrael. And it's like, you know, we, we, we just all love Eretz Yisrael. No politics, no commentary about that, but... If I had the opportunity, so Yehoshua, how does it feel to lead Bnei Yisrael into Eretz Yisrael? 
What were you thinking when you crossed the Arden? What did it mean to be there? Oh my gosh. I'll take your shoe benoon for an hour. That's a good answer. <laughs> What's the worst advice you've ever received? Don't. Don't what? Don't. Don't anything. Don't. Just don't. Don't. There's a new segment that we started. Um, it's named after Simcha Belsky, all of us, Shalom. He's from the community. Um, that he was known from people in the community as, as the guy who would just just do chesed for, for everyone. When's the last time that someone did a chesed for you? Or maybe you did a chesed for someone else that like really made an imprint on you? You know, I'd like to say every single day, every single moment, you know, <clears throat> this doesn't fall into the category of chesed, but um, every living, breathing moment, uh, my wife is going to kill me. My daughter, <laughs> my daughter is going to kill me. I don't know. I don't know what my son-in-law is going to say. You know, it's such a deep question. It really is. You know, when was the last time somebody did a chesed for you? Um, I have to say that every living, breathing moment that um, that uh, that Hashem answered us. How can I equate, you know, chesed of 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 goodwill or chesed of money or chesed of food or, or chesed of a good word of of chesed of a, a twinkle with uh, Hashem's chesed of giving us a child. How can I equate it? So sure, I could say to you, you know, just yesterday in shul, you know, somebody opened the door for me. Um, every single day that Hashem answered us. That's a very honest and a very good answer. I mean, just... The whole goal is is emulating Hashem, trying to be like Hashem as much as possible. So just remembering that idea of that you personally feel that chesed that Hashem gave to you and your wife, that it's, it's very powerful. I, I don't want to sit here and, and sound like I'm the most, uh, you know, spiritual and certainly not a rabbinical person. It, it's like, you know, I talk a lot about inner peace. So much turmoil today. There's so much conflict today. You know, don't look at the news. Don't look at the news. I mean, like, there's nothing good. <laughs> they just don't report anything happy. Oh, once a week for five minutes, let us tell you, you know, the great wonder story of the week. But every single day, Yaiman Valila, morning and night, it's just, I talk a lot about, and Dr. Norman Blumenthal and, and my colleague, Siri Ryder, and Dr. Colleen Amda, we talk about, we talk about finding resilience in children and inner peace. Everyone has to find an inner peace, a place where the body can rest. And my inner peace is my two granddaughters. And that only happened because Eliana, right? So find your inner peace. Is that chesed? It's Hashem's chesed. Hashem gave me chesed of having... When I'm in turmoil, you ask me how I keep going. In a peace. You have to find that. You have to find a way to just, you have to find a way to create a calmness in yourself when the world is just swirling around you in a sandstorm and a windstorm, even when it's a clear sunny day outside. I have an inner peace. I was going to ask you for advice for people listening, but I, I think that's the perfect advice. I'm going to finish off with one last question. What's a story that inspires you? It could be that it happened to you personally. It could be that you heard it once in shul or from a speaker. What's a story that inspires you? Rav David Cohen is always more the Asra for... Um, 53 years, 54 years since Ohal started. Wow. So this is advice. It doesn't fall into the category of a story, so you'll forgive me but advice. That's fine. that's fine. You know, when I joined Ohel, people ask me, you know, how did your life change when I joined Ohel? My phone book. My phone book. I used to have the name of one Rav in my phone book, the <laughs> euphemistic phone book. The name of my Rav in in in, in uh, Kanasa, we were Davin, or by Guru Bala Vashalem. I joined Ohel of David Cohn, with Palm Zetzal, with Shmuel Zazayn Gesund, the Nova Minsk Rebbe, the Square Rebbe, the Baba Vidayan, 
and I could just go on and on and on. Rav David Kahn. I have the opportunity to talk to Rav David often. And so I'll call and ask a shayla on behalf of Ohel. And Rav David often said to me until I finally got it. He said, he said, um, Rav David, he calls me Rav David. <laughs> That's not a shayla halacha. Sounds like you're asking me a policy question, a public relations question. If you want me to give you advice on policy or public relations, I'm happy to. But it's not a shayla halacha. It seems that half the time that I was asking him a question, I was asking him in the realm of not of policy or public relations. I said, Rav David, there are, I don't know many people smarter than you. I would welcome your comments on policy and public relations. So the, the advice, the story is, he taught me how to ask a question. Mm. Sometimes the advice you get or the stories you hear come from the most unusual places. You have to be prepared to hear it. It changed my perspective on conversation with Rav David, and it also changed my listening skills in many ways. Well, David Mendel, thank you so much for doing this. This was an absolute pleasure. I really appreciate it. And I do believe that this conversation will help one person. There we go. It helped me, so we're already <laughs> yaitza with that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this week's episode. It's, it's, I was very moved. I was very moved by this episode. Um, unimportantly, I think he's one of the, and I haven't even told this to him, but I'll say this on here. I think he's one of the most dapper guests I've ever had. I, I love his style. Um, he's so, as a person, as, and I could see why he runs OHEL so successfully because he's just so in order, so thought out, such a good macro level view of how to run things in leadership and, and, um, I really appreciate him coming on and, and just sharing like his own personal story and just everything about OL and what they're doing. If, if you are inspired by this episode and you love the work that OL does, who doesn't? You could go to olfamily.org. They actually, if you're watching this, like when it's released, it's near Pesach, they're doing their Pesach campaign. The more money that they get, the more they can help people. So go ahead and whether you want to volunteer, give a donation any amount is helpful they didn't ask me to say this but i am a fan of what they're doing clearly um i, I think at some point in everyone's life they could use ol services so go ahead and be helpful there if you got to this point in the episode on youtube i want you to comment passionate that's the code word I mean, we've been doing it it's been great actually um a few people texted me i don't know why you don't just put it on youtube so comment the word passionate you could also share your thoughts about this episode your favorite moment uh suggestions in the youtube comments whatever you type there i read every single thing and sometimes I give it a thumbs up sometimes i give it a heart so yeah do that and um check out our other podcasts check out the advertisers again the the bloodline for this show does that make sense the bloodline i don't know but tell me in the comments if that even makes sense but the the way that we get the show off the ground is by advertisers because then i can pay my editor and the graphics team and etc so go ahead and check out the unrestricted podcast go ahead and give joma a call or check out their podcast and go ahead and do a simcha time you go to simchatime.org to submit the simcha time that you did really really great i'm telling you i've been doing this for the past month it's it's making me feel better uh we have michael in the other room she did simcha time for me last week michael you didn't do a simcha time for me this week silence complete silence from michael there but um that that's a joke don't force anyone to do anything you just do the chesed for people share this episode with anyone that you think could inspire them for anyone that that maybe is thinking of giving up you send this to them i think this is a very powerful message until next oh we have a very exciting episode next week very different than anything i've ever done so stay tuned for that uh, a few singers are in it a few to say that. Till next time, keep on finding inspiration. Living Lechaim.